uh, I'm excited to be here. This is the second time I have um, been asked and excited to come out here to the Search Church and speak to you guys. I've kind of like fallen in love with Philadelphia um, and the CR team, so it's great. I'm going to try to dance a little bit so that no one gets ignored, and I'm not going to hide here because no one can see me. So we'll do some of this. Um, like you mentioned, I'm the CMO of a company called Big Door. We work in the loyalty space. Uh, I was with SEO Moz prior, you may know of them, and also worked in a lot of customer data. And in fact, the mo majority of my time that last year at SEO Moz was spent on retention marketing and lifecycle marketing and loyalty marketing, which is really fun, and I'm, I'm falling in love with it. And it's very different than my roots in performance marketing and data analytics. But you find that so much of, as you guys know, everything we do is overlapping and coming together, which we're going to hear a lot about today. So I'm going to jump in. I'm going to do an intro to customer analytics. What does it mean? What does it mean for all of you in the room? What does it mean for the teams you're on? What are we going to have to know moving forward? We're going to talk about all that stuff. So jumping right in, why do I think it's important to understand something about customer analytics? I think we're all really aware that the linear funnel we may have started our careers in doesn't exactly exist this way anymore. There's been a paradigm shift. Every funnel, however you want to say, discovery funnel, purchase funnel, uh, influencer funnel, all of them have changed, right? It's not from one step to the next step to the next step. We can't look at our data in aggregate anymore. Uh, and when we haven't been able to for a couple of years. So this is no longer what we're working with, which makes every step harder. It means that we're introducing new KPIs, we're introducing new tools, and we're introducing new insights. And like he mentioned, we're, we're swimming in data. Um, I think it looks a lot more like this now, where customers are coming in, they're understanding us, they're discovering us in many different ways, in many different platforms, they're circling back, they're using, uh, you know, they're advocating on our behalf and then they're circling back. There's a lot of moving forward, steps back to the side, things that we just has, traditionally, our analytics didn't show it this way. Uh, whether they didn't show us how things attributed correctly or they didn't show us the many different avenues that the customers could go when they found us, went through our, our funnels and then hopefully became customers and then hopefully learned to love us, that linear step is just very different now. So I'm gonna talk about how we can use customer analytics to provide insight into this new landscape that we're all playing in. I think it all kind of stems back to this, customer loyalty matters more than ever. And I say that not just because for the business case it means more than ever, that 80% of your company's future revenue will come from just 20% of your existing customers, which is both awesome and terrifying to think about right now, the future of your company is incredibly dependent on how you treat your customers today, not which ones you get tomorrow or the ones you get next week or how good you do next quarter. It has more to do with that group right now. That's like a, that's a very, uh, it's a very sobering fact. But I think that it plays into that past funnel, the one I just showed you. Because now that our customers have found us, and now that they've done anything with us, whether it's an interaction or a purchase, we are held to a new standard of delighting them. Ones that the, a lot of the marketers in the room that had, traditionally maybe have been in performance or acquisition marketing, it wasn't necessarily what we were tasked to do. I don't know about you guys, but 10 years ago when I did marketing, I was primarily acquisition marketing, I did a lot of paid marketing, and when someone came in, I was like, sweet, job done. I did that so well. And I left it up to someone else. I was like, they, that guy over there's got it. Someone else is handling that customer. I got him in the door, they're doing what we need him to do, someone else is gonna go keep him happy. And I, it's just not the case anymore. For all of us in the room, we might not currently have bullets on our job descriptions that say understand customer data, understand how to use customer data, customer data-driven marketing. We will. I mean, I do think we all have it. Maybe it's like grayed out right now. We're not paying attention to it. But every single one of us in our next jobs, it will be something they expect of online marketers. And the teams that we staff, we should be staffing people that understand this stuff. So super important from the business case, also super important from the evolution of a sale. So this is something I think about a lot, and I think about this paradigm shift because it happened in all of our careers, and this is a pretty new industry. This all happened in the last 10 to 15 years, which is the idea that there was a point that you could win as a company if you just had what someone needed. It was the long tail strategy, right? And if we did it really well, if we did SEO really well, it was back when exact search queries and long tail queries and exact match domains and great landers that were really specific or great ad copies on our PPC campaigns that were exactly what they wanted. If we did all that really, really well, we could sell a lot of stuff. And that was great. And then everyone got really good at that. And everyone saturated that market and more people came in and more people did that well. So then we had to come up with a differentiator 
for a company to stand out, it had to do something amazingly well. Our, our unique value proposition had to be stunning. Maybe we did it, maybe we had better quality products, maybe we had better customer service, maybe our user experience was stunning. Whatever it was, we had to do that really well. And then everyone got better at that. And I love that about this industry, we level up fast. I mean, you're all here tonight because you wanna learn, you wanna hang out, and we all wanna learn from each other. That doesn't happen in every other industry. But because of it, everything gets done faster and everyone levels up quicker. So now we're back to that third step where now people have to love your brand. And that can mean a lot of things. We'll talk about that today. I'm sure it will come up in many ways. But you have to build loyalty. And it's different now to build loyalty than it used to be. It's not, it doesn't take as long as it used to. It's not as hard as it once was because customers want to love brands. They want to advocate. They have platforms available to do so. So if you think about it that way, it's really just starting to meet the customer need, which is just a different customer need than we might have had in the past. But that's what it takes to sell today, to sell a product to someone. There has to have been many touch points, we'll talk about that later, many seated moments of trust. And all of that is uncovered through customer analytics. I dropped customer loyalty because this is something I'm very excited about right now. I'm calling it reciprocal loyalty. Traditionally, there are four types of loyalty. There's a no loyalty, an inertia loyalty, a latent loyalty, and a premium loyalty. We don't need to talk about that right now. Those are the traditional four types of loyalty a customer can have to you. I think that there's this fifth loyalty that's happening called reciprocal loyalty, which is beyond the customer being loyal to a brand, which is something we've all tried to encourage, you know, whether as marketers or the other teams at our company, the product teams or the customer service teams. And I think that we're over here, where the brand also has to be loyal to the customer. And when I say that, I mean it in every level, which is that every time we get in a room and discuss our quarterly goals, every time we get more budget, every time we get an okay on a new hire, we as marketing leaders sit down and say, am I gonna invest it in the customer? And if I am, how would I spend that money? Who would I hire? What, what campaign will I run? What channel will I double down on? Those aren't the same questions as, will I hit my company's business goals? They should in the long run match up, right? We should all hope that. But it's not the same thing. If you say to yourself, I want to increase page views, I want to increase Twitter followers, I want to increase mentions, I want to increase press coverage, that's not the same as saying, I want, to, um, I want more people to understand our mission statement, I want more people to visit our about section, I want more people to not only love our homepage, but discover this great free resource that's two pages deep. Let's optimize that funnel. Let's send them to the free stuff because they'll love it. Those are totally different questions and strategies and we as marketers have to start doing that sort of stuff. I think that's what's happening right now and I think the companies that really invest in this idea and this paradigm shift of reciprocal loyalty are really gonna win. To do it, customer analytics comes into play. So every marketing discipline has returned because back in the day I really do think when we were smaller and there was less options available to us and we didn't really know what we were doing, I think we were focused on the customer. I think we got a little overwhelmed we got covered in data. I think we got into the race of it all. We started gaming a lot of the systems, me included, right, with the channels, and we started to learn them well. We started to just do what we wanted to do to win, not necessarily to do it for the customer. So I think every discipline is returning to customers, and I'm excited about this shift. I also think it means we have to better understand them. As does happen with every channel, the better we get at them, we can use them for good or we can use them for bad. And so to use it for good, we now have to uncover a lot of needs from our customers. We have to hear them differently. We have to aggregate that data differently. We have to use it, unlock it, surface it to the rest of the company, change the priorities. This is a serious shift in the way a lot of the companies, I guarantee in the room, are thinking of all this. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. What is customer analytics, right? Like, what is the definition? Customer analytics is a process by which data from customer behavior is used to help make key business decisions. So a lot of people, when they think about customer data, they're just like, you know, like the survey that I put out to my customers when they told me what they wanted, right? Or we got customer profiles, we got personas, we're good. And some of that is customer data, but it doesn't go far enough into the customer behavior piece. And that's huge. So you really need to be thinking about the different ways that all of your customer data is coming together and how to unlock that. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. There's a lot of types of customer analytics. So some of them, personas, just discussed it. It's great to know your personas. It is not great to go into a room and sit down with a bunch of people that have worked at the company for a long time and say, who's our target audience? 
Let's create names and personas for them. That's not persona building, right? It should be rooted in the data. And we'll talk about some of the places that you can get that data, but you should go look at the behavior of your customers on your sites, with your products, with your neighboring partnership sites, um, in store, whatever. You should look at the actual behavior, and those should build your personas. And that's the type of persona that I'm talking to up here. Customer service, we all kind of understand this, right? We know that our customer service teams hear the most from our customers, but I don't know about you, but a lot of the times it's kind of me stopping by the customer service team or the room and being like, you know, is there a big problem? I see this happening. It's very reactive. It's very put out of fire. Instead, you should be empowering your customer service teams to be summarizing what they're hearing, to be the pulse of your customer, to be surfacing it to the rest of the company. That is a huge step in this, and one that there's just too big of a wall in between right now. Uh, product feedback, same thing. How many people here work on product teams? Right. How many? Well, two. Two of us. How many of us talk to our product teams every day? Four of us, awesome. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't. I have, we have to be. Marketing and product are coming together, not just in product marketing, but they're just starting to merge. Product-driven companies, marketing is now leading the way both in how people find us and how they stick with us. It's going to be, that's what, how you see all these growth teams, customer success teams. It's all coming because we're starting to merge. You should, not, you should know what your product team's hearing I guarantee you they have an other category that comes through the product request tab, and I guarantee it's some of the best stuff that we as marketers could know. They loved something on the page. They wish something else was on the page. Why isn't that on the pricing page? I don't know about this. I have this question over and over and over again. And they get thrown into some other category because it's not about the product. But it's stuff that could seriously improve our funnels, seriously improve our, 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 uh, our messaging to our customers. So that's huge. Customer advisory boards, cabs really important, even if you only have a client list of five or 10 people, pick one or two of them, get them on the phone regularly, have an ongoing relationship, send them lots of good things, thank them for their time. They're the ones that need to know where you're going as a company, what you want to be, and then give you constant feedback. And you can do this through surveys, some are formal, some are different you know, UX reviews, but a lot of it's just on the phone like, hey, we're thinking of introducing X. How's that make you feel? You know us really well. Customer advisory board, it's really important. Net promoter score, meh. Outdated, somewhat crappy, right? Score of one to 10 review. Still somewhat of a good gauge. I look at all data points as good as long as I can benchmark them against themselves. And then as long as you know the limitations of that data, you can still pull insights from them. The Net Promoter Score, for those that don't know, is a score of one to 10 survey you give. I would ask, I would ask you, you know, how likely are you to promote my brand or product to your friends, right? And it's like out of a one to 10, you throw out everything in the middle and you get these polar options. You should be running some sort of sentiment analysis, even if it's primitive. For what it's worth, I think that this section is gonna get a huge overhaul in the next year or two. I know lots of people that are working on analytic suites around customer sentiment. I think it's gonna become really sexy and really awesome, and I'm really excited to see it happen. So that will continue to evolve. Cohort analysis, you should be taking your customers, you should be breaking them out into cohorts. There should be groups that you're looking at. And I'm not just saying, you know, like top tier pricing customer, low tier, you know, high value, low value. It should be around other dimensions, dimensions that your company thinks is valuable. Um, at Moz, one of our dimensions was have they ever like been to an event? It was so important to us that people found us and we would do that through a variety of things, whether we uh, circle it back to an email list about an event like MozCon or something, but we would add in the dimensions that we found to be valuable. And you should be building, you should have many different types of cohorts, even if you don't use them all at the same time. You should just be thinking about it in that way because it gives you a different lens for your customers. Um, customer profiles, we talked a little bit about that. One thing to keep in mind, there was kind of this period in time where sites weren't that excited about having kind of registered communities, and, we're, and now with social auth, it's really easy for someone to come and work with us and not really give us that much information. I think it's a dangerous pe precedent, and I think that you should be thinking about where you can capture customer data in a profile manner, because I know we've all been there where we're in a room, and we're talking about next quarter's marketing campaign, and we're like, wouldn't it be great if we could market to them by X, like maybe um, a category they like, or you know, a topic they enjoy reading about, and we're like, we didn't capture that in their profiles. And then you gotta go send out the email blast and ask them to tell you that information, and then you can go do the campaign. If you're starting that from the beginning and thinking of how can you capture customer profile information and what is valuable for future marketing efforts, this is gonna become a hell of a lot easier. So thinking about that is really exciting to me. Customer surveys, we do a lot of that. I think that's probably the one that most people default to when we say customer analytics. As you can tell, it's so much more, but still really valuable, um, and again, Surveying, we are so reactive as markers. I only send a survey when I want to know if they're mad at me. You know, <laughs> it's like um, our site went down or like our, you know, our, our, we didn't update the index, so I'll send a survey and I'm like, 
hey guys, just checking in. Is there anything you want to see from us? Really sorry about that thing breaking. And it should not be that way. Like we should not be talking to our customers because we're afraid they're going to leave us. Let's move out of fear. Let's get excited and proactive about it. That's kind of where I'm going with customer analytics in general. So that's all grand, right? That's like a lot of fun, exciting stuff. But where the hell do we start? Because we're all pretty busy. We have a lot to do. And I guarantee that most of us in the room, everything I just talked about is something you do once a year, once a quarter maybe. Maybe not even once a year. Let's be real. You guys, maybe some of you have never done any of that. That's totally fine, too. Because a lot of marketing until now, everything I just said was a different team. Or again, it was a reactive campaign or an end of the year type campaign that you ran once so that you could understand what to do next year. Um, and what I'm trying to say is I really think we have to lace it in to every campaign we touch on a weekly basis. And we need to be thinking about it, you know, 25% of our time spent in a day. At some point, we refer to one of those things I mentioned or something around that and say to ourselves, what's going on with our customers? That's as, that's as important as I think this will be moving forward. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about some tips for getting that started, because it's hard. Number one, you have to create everything I just said as a common team goal, a company-wide goal which is really hard. And I know this from firsthand experience that when you start talking to everyone in the company, I don't know if any of you have felt this, you're like, we should do more for our customers. Like, I feel like we've gone away from the customers. Let's talk about it. And everyone gets really defensive because that's everyone's job, right? That's my team. That's my, get back up, right? Like, you see like hallway fights. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but we, I mean, you get heated when you're like, no, my, my team handles, my team, we have the product, we're about retention, we're here to retain. Your team sells. Your team acquires, my team retains. That's really dangerous. And I think those philosophies have been what have hurt a lot of the big, big companies when you get so segmented that those teams don't even live in the same building anymore. And you totally forget what the customer even wants. So how do we do this? I don't, I don't believe in bulleted slides, by the way, guys, but I had to do it. Don't be mad at me. I literally wanted to leave you guys with a bunch of stuff to like, this is exactly what we've done at some companies that I've worked in and some companies I've worked with. So one, create a tiger team. It has to be cross-departmental. I love Tiger Teams. Apparently this is actually a real reference. I thought that it was like made up by one of my bosses, but it's not. There's like, so you pick a person from each team. We did this at Moz. One customer service, one marketing, one product, one dev, maybe two devs, one designer, um, one person from ops. And we had to meet once every two weeks, and all we talked about was the customer. You crowdsource often, so getting that whole group together, put them in a room and say to yourselves, let's come up with what common KPIs we want to care about. Let's come, on, come up with common campaigns we'd want to run, common questions we all have about our customers, common problems we're all having. I guarantee you will see that three or four things surface. It's amazing. And you're like, oh my god, I feel that too. I was wondering that. Do you have that data? You find that a lot of the biggest questions we have as marketers, other teams have. They just didn't know that it'd be valuable to us. Get the weight of the leadership behind you. We pulled an all-staff meeting. We sat down and we're like, the next two years will be about customers. And every one of these teams, everyone in this room, is now held responsible for building brand loyalty with our customers. Ta-da! And it's amazing how that can pull the weight together. Crowdsource over beers and coffee. I talk about this because a lot of people outside of that Tiger team, again, are going to want to be really involved. So we would run happy hours that were just about the customer. We'd sit down over beers and coffee, and we'd ask, you know, so what do you think? What do you think? You know, we're thinking this. Does that even resonate with you? And again, it's just crowdsourcing great ideas. Setting up an alias, so setting up a customer at alias or loyalty at alias. People are sending ideas. Hey, I noticed today when I was on the site putting X, Y, D, Q together that that might be hard. Do we have any data that this might be hard for the customer, X, Y, Z? And it just goes to, a, to that Tiger team, and they're reading it all the time. It's a plethora of ideas coming at them all the time, which also keeps it front of mind. Um, re reiterating often what each team has done to make progress. So again, when you get a Tiger team, the best thing about it is every team starts to see how much every team is trying to hit this and trying to do better. And that's really good for team morale. It's also really good for your company's bottom line. Um, and then reporting it out to the company format in a company format, not a team format. So I don't know about you guys, but um, pretty much every company I've worked at, you get into the like weekly digest from team. So this is like the customer service team digest, and this is the marketing performance digest, and this is you know the product summary digest. This needs to be a company-wide Digest, we always sent it out from Rand or the E-Team, where they would say, here's what, here's what customer loyalty and engagement looks like right now, guys. And it'd be the KPIs that the company decided on and the projects that the company's working on, and everything was company-driven. So we did a lot of this. You have to create the common goal. It doesn't exist in one team. So even if all of you get really excited about this and go back and say, all right, marketing's going to own this, it will fail. I tried. It failed. So you have to open it up to everyone, and you have to find a way to have that common conversation. 
So number two, unlocking the data, probably the hardest thing, and I guarantee everyone will talk about this today. So much data, so hard to get to, so hard to get to because a lot of the data is in mediums that we were not trained in. We understand, you know, Google Analytics, I'm not sure we understand our big data sets, maybe we understand some of this customer data I talked about, but the other stuff, the data log files, you know, throwing together stuff in SQL, having tables, combining them, putting them, pulling stuff, extracting out of CRM APIs, that shit's hard. I can't do it. And I mean, I, I'm, I, I like to think maybe sometimes I can be a technical marketer, but I am not a technical marketer. I was not rooted in technical marketing. So it's hard. So what does that actually look like? I think this is, might be the last slide with bullets. So I apologize for a second time. Um, sitting in a room, figuring out where the data is, your CRM, your data logs, your analytics, GA otherwise, figuring out an amazing amount of data that we all have hacked together in Excel. Well, that's great, it's shared with you. <laughs> or maybe it's shared with the team on Google Docs, but it certainly is not shared company-wide. And even if they did get in, they don't understand your Excel wizardry that you've put together in your head. They don't have the magical decoder ring, so they can't get to it anyways. So thinking about where all the data is currently, <laughs> finding out your SQL Ninja, um, be nice to said SQL Ninja, love said SQL Ninja, obsess over SQL Ninja or two. And I, for me, I actually truly believe that that person has to live on marketing. Um, I snagged that person up so fast. She was actually hanging out in ops doing customer retention for them in like an involuntary churn basis. And I was like, you and I are gonna be friends. You don't even know it. You're on my team. It's gonna be exciting. And she is, and she did great. I mean, like you get that one person that is so excited about manipulating the data, building the tables and coming up with new insights. So that person should really be around you all the time. Um, once you start to build out these data sets, these convergences of the data, you really should try to give it a approachable interface that the entire company can use. So pick the least technical person at your company. Pick the person that is just, I mean, it usually is like the cultural beacon, maybe it's someone who just loves to talk to your customers but never works in any tools, never works in any data, and ask them how they would want to see the customer data. And then build an interface, a dashboard somewhere that you can visualize all of this data to them in a way that they would want to check it every day. Our goal is to have the entire company, we call it Gizmo at Moz, have everyone at the company log into Gizmo once a week. That was just, I mean, it was beautiful funnels, it was beautiful pie charts, some of it more valuable than others, some was really basic information, some was really complex, hard to get information. Whatever it is, you need to give it a face that the entire company can consume or just the power users at your company will care about this. And that's not valuable. Um, making the report shareable, beautiful, right? A lot of it uh, exporting. And then referring back to it often. So the thing about that I've seen happen, especially at a couple companies that I've consulted with, they do everything up until this last bullet. And everything I just said becomes a one-time effort. Because if you don't report everything out and if you don't make those reports shareable and gorgeous, you will not get the investment needed to upkeep a project like this. And you need it, you need new images, new visualizations, new data sources, another SQL Ninja, two more marketers on retention and loyalty. This becomes a team or it doesn't work. It doesn't become rooted in the DNA of your company. So to do that, you have to make the case for it. And the good thing is, as marketers, we're really good at internal evangelizing. We've been doing it for years. We got this. Like we're really good at cross-departmental selling, right? We do it externally to the world. We do it internally to everyone else around us. Use your efforts here. Um, so the right tools in place. The right tools are kind of up for debate. I put up my favorite tools. Surveying tools, customer service tools, and sentiment analytics, I think, are the three best places to start. And I put up my favorite tools to do it. It doesn't, maybe you already have something in place, that's not the point, but I do think that you need to have one of each of these. And if you as a marketer are not playing in one of each of the categories, I don't think that you're doing enough to care about what the customer wants. If you're, if you're waiting for that once a month summary from your customer service team, you're gonna be about 29 days behind the curve. you know. So going in, getting familiar with the dashboards the other teams are using. The best thing is when you're doing the surveys or someone on your team is and you're talking to customer service all the time and you're the one that's paying attention to the sentiment analytics and the reason for what it's worth that I put up platform level is Twitter's introducing a lot of information. Facebook is obviously introducing a great deal. The platforms themselves are already starting to surface some of this great customer data to us with their own metrics and their own KPIs. So us getting to know them, that's great. But when you're like, like tri-pronged approach here, you're gonna become the person that is a non-redundant at your company. And I'm a huge fan of non-redundancy for both job security and because it's just fun to be like, I know all the things. And that's what this is. So to become a non-redundant means that no one else at the company could be asked 
a question that you are asked and give a better answer than you could. And when it comes to customer data, which again, I just think we'll continue to see this hammered over us for the next couple of years, you want to be the non-redundant on the team. That's the person that is literally brought in to say, how do we grow this company? Because we've got all these customers, who understands them? It's the person that's playing in these all day, or once a week at least. So thinking about it in that way. Number four, testing that first program. So I actually put up a number, it's hard, kind of hard to read, but you'll get, you'll get access to these, right? They'll get access to all this. I actually put up my first favorite places to start. Now, obviously, we're all with different models. Some of us are agencies. Some of us are SaaS models, whatever your model. Here are some places to start using the customer data to actually run programs. So your help docs, like, I'm just not going to go through all of them, but like, here's, a, here's an example. Your help docs. How many of us as marketers think to ourselves, I wonder if our help documentation is incredibly optimized? And I wonder what I could do knowing how much CRO experience I have, design theory experience I have, and all the information that I now know about my customer, I wonder how much more effective they could be. And if they are more effective, I wonder how much more they would love us. And if they love us more, how much more money they would give us. And then I get a raise, right? So thinking about that, something as simple as that, starting there. Our help documentation is usually forgotten about, written once and never remembered again. Um, other ones, your, uh, I already talked a little bit about it, but the why campaign. How many of us in the room have gone to our CEOs and said, I need $15,000 because I'm going to go do a video about why this company exists. And then I'm going to put the weight of community and social and my paid marketing and my, paid ad my social paid advertising. I'm going to put all of that for one month into amplifying our why campaign. You know, We have to start seeding those conversations with our CEO now. That shouldn't be a press effort that happens just when we need to rebrand or just when we need to, uh, maybe we're having an online reputation problem. It should be something we do proactively to seed exactly what we want the world to hear in a beautiful way. And so that's what I'm talking about when I think about those first programs. And we need to make the case for them early. But I put up some other ones on here. It's amazing. I mean, yeah, your cancellation, like if there's a cancellation page or a section on your site, I guarantee you that you don't spend enough time looking at the data when people cancel. Uh, we went and tested out all sorts of different surveys, all sorts of different questions. Like if someone put technical as the reason they were canceling, we surfaced a different phone number that they could call that would get prioritized in the queue. And just trying to play with those triggers and those levers. I mean, it's amazing not only to see how you can affect the bottom line fast, but all the data you learn in the meantime. So valuable. So I put up some ideas. The last one, evangelizing the wins and the losses. As marketers, it's really easy for us to want to test things and maybe not evangelize the tests that don't work. One, we have a lot of things running at once. Two, it takes a lot of time to pull together data results and send them out and handle all the questions. When it comes to this stuff, customer analytics, it's critical that you start surfacing to the company where the company is failing with your customers. And it's even more critical that when all the teams get up in a huff about it and respond with a million questions that you take the time to address it and you take the time to say to them, we're going to bring that up in that customer retention tiger team meeting, or we're going to bring that up in next quarter with the CEO in front of the whole company, because that's a great question. It's that stuff that completely takes the entire company and levels them. And now everyone's worried about the same thing and has the same problem. And that's what makes great companies, when we're all invested in the same thing and no ego gets caught in the way. So that's what can come from this. I want to just give an example. We did this by making beautiful reports and reporting it out often. It wasn't always pretty. You know, so at Moz, we came up with loyalty cohorts. It was kind of with how long they had been with us. It's called the RFM model, recency, frequency, monetary, which is you take a cohort and you say, how, much, how often do they come? When they do come back, how often do they come in a small period of time? And then how much money do we make off of them? And we create a loyalty cohort. And guys, I don't know, like, lifer being about 50% was awesome. Non-loyal trumped our loyal group. Non-loyal grew really hard, really fast for a long period of time at Moz, and that was really hard to report out when you have 80 people trying to do amazing stuff and you're sending out a report that's like, people that are coming in are not staying for three months or more. They're leaving in 90 days. Let's figure it out. If we didn't figure out this visualization, when we first showed this to the E-team, it was like panic. There was like, what? They're not staying for 90 days. We have a 30-day free trial. You know, <laughs> it was like, ugh. But you have to. It changes the course of the company. So everything became focused on the non-loyal bucket. We spent a lot of time on the lifer bucket. I don't know about you guys, I read pie charts, the lifer bucket was doing fine. It was the other group that we weren't paying as much attention to because we just assumed they were making it through the hurdles. So thinking about it that way. So that sure sounds like a lot, right? I think when I talk about this stuff, more and more you kind of get this face like, that's not my job, I have a job, I'm very busy, and that's what I'm saying. I think it is your new job. I 
I think it's all, all of our jobs. I think that when we start, whether you're an organic marketer, or paid marketer, growth marketer, community marketer, social marketer, an editor, brand marketer, copywriter, wherever you are, if you're not spending one fifth of your week in customer analytics, you will not be spending your time in the right places. And you won't become the non-redundant on the team. You want to get hired at the next job that's the best job, it's the job that's perfect for you. A great skill to have is to say, I can unlock the customer data and help this company move faster in the right direction. And that's what I think a lot of this stuff is. So I think that's it. I think it makes everything more fun. I really do believe that. I, I, I know for years I got caught up in the, in the KPIs that weren't customer driven. And I'd end the day just kind of feeling like, sweet, I made a bunch of money. And now uh, I, don't, I barely touch a campaign unless a customer is going to be stoked. I'm like, that sounds like a great growth campaign for money. Someone else should do that. I'm going to go over here and talk to the customers because I, I want to know that they're loving what I'm doing and I want to spend my day on marketing they're enjoying. So anyways, that's me. I'm going to round up. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very Thanks, much. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.